like you remember pull out like the phones where you pulled out the keyboard and typed on them oh hold on real quick now that there's the tangent there's the there's the egg i fucking loved pull out pull out phones like that was pull dope. Out keyboards yeah because the problem with touch touch things is I'm, I'm trying to text text my girl on during class time i don't know what i'm saying i gotta be looking teachers like hey yeah, yeah. what you doing I'm trying to get my dick sucked what you think <laughs> You know, you don't want everybody up in your business. You got, sometimes want to keep it on the DL. If I got a physical keyboard, I know exactly what I'm saying. And I can send it. I got big thumbs though, so I'm accidentally hitting different letters on this touch on this touch phone. That happens to me all the time. <laughs> this I is to... like the this is like the conversation that people were having when the iPhone first came out about why they didn't want it. <laughs> how am I, I going to send my sweet dick pics without, and we're like t- without having to tell other people? We're like 10 years on where like, that's the only thing that exists and we're still fucking like, how the fuck am I supposed to use this keyboard on this damn phone? <laughs> anyway, what's up, Internet, and welcome to your obligatory movie podcast, a stereotypical show where three twenty somethings come together to record themselves, talk about movies as a flimsy excuse to talk to each other. I'm your buddy, your friend, your pal, your super tramp, John Romo, and I'm joined by the Chippendale of Cinema, Trace Aver, and oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, here he comes, here he comes, nobody. What? We ain't got nobody this week. Nobody. It's just, just you and me. Well, what, what, who, who's the other guy that's usually here? Well, it's usually Taylor Dvorsky. But you know, I don't actually, <laughs> I don't actually know why he's not here. <laughs> he just said he couldn't be, <laughs> and I didn't fucking Full ask. <laughs> Full disclosure: He really just said, "Yeah, I can't make it this week." And neither me or Jay were really like, "Well, why not?" You know, it wasn't until a text, what, like an hour ago. Where he says, staying in my boss's pool house for the next two weeks while we wait to move into our new place. So assuming he'll have Wi-Fi. And <laughs> something about that was like, wait, that's what's happening? That's why this don't work? Yeah. And so, I mean, uh, according according to the man himself, he should be able to make it next week. But, I mean, for now, we decided the show would be just fine without him. Well, we've done this before. Last time we did it, we talked about the guest. And that would, that was a good time. That that went on for a lot longer than we anticipated. The I guess is was... such a good ass movie. Yeah, um, but folks, if you don't know what the show is about, each week us three typically uh, talk about what we've been watching this week. Maybe some news when we l- take the time to read some stuff, and in the second half, we deep dive into one film in particular. And the kicker here is that each week the film has to be tangentially related to the previous week's film. So last week was the Thera. And through the connection of Kirsten Stewart to Kirsten Stewart, we've landed on Into the Wild for this week. Uh, directed by Sean Penn, starring Emil Hirsch, and various others, including Miss Kristen Stewart. That's right. But this week, we've got to pick another film before we move on. And it's actually Taylor's week, so yeah. how do we... Uh... Well, we're going to use the phone a friend option, and we're just we're going to give him a quick little phone call. I guess I'll be the one to do it. Well, we can both try and see who... Okay, yeah, we'll see who he picks up for. Where's it at? Oh, damn. <laughs> Where's it at? Got this bitch on speed dial. Remember when speed dial was an actual thing? You could, like, star one somebody? Yeah. That's almost like MySpace oh. top ten. Oh, there he is. We, we got an answer. Um, Wait, how is this? I, you can't hear Jay, though. How is this going to work? Um, I guess you'll just have to hear me, Taylor, and I'll repeat what Jay says to you. Yeah, this will just be a fun editing job for Jay. <laughs> um... So, so Taylor, um, we're we're in the middle of recording right now, and uh-huh. we we just need whatever movie options that you came up with us for. Okay, for. sweet. How's the recording going? Is it better without me? Yeah, it's fantastic. I've never been on a podcast that was this good before. You know what's wild? Cool, sweet. Oh wait, J- Jay's talking. Hold on. You know what's wild? We started. Uh, we got on the call about six minutes ago. And we're already about four minutes into the show, so that means we didn't waste forty-five minutes like we do every fucking week. Taylor, to fill you in, uh, Jay ex- pointed out the fact that we're about six minutes into recording, but we're, we're about four minutes into the actual show, so we actually didn't waste a bunch of time before getting into the episode like we usually do. Cool. <laughs> I t- I'll take direct blame, I guess. <laughs> Taylor, what movies did you come up with for us? Okay, sweet. Um, the cinematographer of Into the Wild. That's what you guys watched this week, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't watch the movie, so you know, <laughs> didn't have to worry about it. Um, uh, Eric Gautier, 
Uh-huh. Uh, he also shot a movie, uh, an Ang Lee film called Taking Woodstock, which stars Dimitri Martin. Really? Oh, wait. Yeah. I, know, I wanted to see that movie when it came out because I used to be the biggest Dimitri Martin fan in the world. Well, that is one of your options for this week. Um, separately... Um, Eddie Vedder of Pearl Jam fame right. is a, a um, credited composer on Into the Wild. He did a lot of and original the, songs for it. Yeah, and obviously this um, this uh, opens up uh, opens up a ton of stuff for potential options. Did you know this dude was apparently in an episode of Twin Peaks and The Return? Which dude? Uh, it says Eddie Vedder is credited as an an actor. Really? And. Or wait, no, maybe he's just. Oh, wait, was there a Pearl Jam song in one of the in one of the uh, the the, fi- the final like in the finale, like the credit club scenes? Um, I don't remember. He's credited. So I don't know, man. Hmm. Um, but anyways, um, uh, Eddie Vedder has received a ton of music credits across many movies, but he was rather than a music credit, he was faint in the credits for Jackass Number Two. Oh shit. <laughs> He was thinking. So your two options this week are, or for next week, and I thank you, else, Eddie. So, are, um, Eddie Vedder, who apparently made Jackass two happen, and um, <laughs> if, if Eddie Vedder did not contribute the funds, then Jackass two would not have happened. Thank, and that's why he got a single thank you credit in Jackass two. <laughs> so you got Jackass two are taking one stop. I just wait, Taylor, about the Twin Peaks thing. What if Pearl Jam just showed up? at the end of Twin Peaks for one of the episodes and just did a performance. I mean, you remember that time in the middle of an episode where David Lynch fully disrupted everything just to let Nine Inch Nails, Nine Inch Nails perform? That's a good app. That's a really good app. Okay. Um, well, thank you, Taylor. Well, um, he has to go- hear. He has to hear oh. what we picked. Oh, I guess, yeah, you'll be on next week. Okay. Uh, so what are we going to pick? Hmm. Um, I mean, I would love to dissect the, you know, psychology behind each individual stunt in Jackass 2. <laughs> That that does seem like the obvious choice of what sh- we should be picking. But I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to pull in with the underdog, and I'll I'll say taking Woodstock. You'll s- here. Hold on. I'm gonna look at taking Woodstock on on a site real quick. I'm just picking it solely based on the fact that it has like things like plot and characters and story that, structure. Okay. See, that's that's true. It might be kind of hard to actually discuss Jackass too. What do you mean? We can do an elaborate breakdown on every. No, we would just we would look at every single stunt in the film. That I mean, we would discuss every single prank and every single stunt um, and give our thoughts on it. You know what? I'm changing my mind. It's Jackass Two. Yeah, I think this is pretty easily Jackass Two. Actually, yeah, I think that's it. Jackass (laughs) Two. We're doing Jackass Two. Jackass Two, sweet. All right. Well, um, Taylor, thank you for your time. Anything Um, you want to say before he leaves? Do do you want to say anything before um, you take off? Anything for the fans? Um, anything for the, anything for the fans? Um, hey guys, I advise um, you're gonna live next before your lease ends at a current place. Um, <laughs> is that's why I'm not on this week's podcast. Well, um, everyone wish Taylor luck. He might not have a home, and yeah, I do have. I do. Have, I do. Good news. I do. Have uh, a home no, here. no. Let, everyone wish him luck. He might be homeless, and let's just hope We're he might. Let's just hope. Let's just. Um, let's hope we makes it. He makes it back on his feet. Okay, thank you, Taylor. Bye. My favorite thing is that his mother is probably one of the listeners, and I would love if <laughs> that was the first time she heard. Wait, my son don't got a home. <laughs> oh, the chaos. <laughs> well, um, speaking of chaos, next week's film, Jackass number two. We're gonna have to figure out how we're gonna do that one, but. We It'll just figured fun. it out. We're gonna we're gonna analyze every single individual stunt. It's gonna be a long one. I'm it's looking forward to it. <laughs> it's gonna be a good one. Um, <laughs> but, oh wait, Jay. Um, yeah. I'm sorry. Did you have a good Halloween? Um, we saw. I, I well for Halloween, I dressed up as dog from Cat Dog at That's work. Dope. At work, but I didn't want to wear the ears or the sign that said dog, so everyone just thought I was cheese or pizza. <laughs> Which I guess works because I work at a grocery store, and I was just like, I guess I'm okay. pep- I'm pepperoni pizza. Um, aside from that, you know, when you deal with anxiety, Halloween really is just kind of anxiety inducing. And also, uh-huh. when you don't have a kid, I don't get it. You know, um, I like the aesthetic of Halloween. 
Um, and I like the decorations, but as far as what to actually do on Halloween, I yeah, I like know. I I like the Halloween season. Halloween yeah. though, I'm just like, eh, I guess yeah, it's like, almost Christmas I mean, though. Yeah, I mean, I guess like that's why. I mean, as an adult, you're supposed to give out candy to kids, and that's kind of what you do. But like, I didn't get any trick or treaters where I live. So yeah, it's not until I get a home that I should expect some kids. One thing yeah. that we did do for Halloween is uh, get spooked by the terrors of drug addiction. Which oh, is, is that, I, I guess that kind of brings me to what we've been watching. Um, is that right? Yes. We Funny thing, though, and I want to point this out. We went to the mall, and they when we got there, it was about 8 o'clock at night. They already had their Christmas tree up. I'm just like, folks. Oh, my God, really? It's not even 11-1 yet. Let's <laughs> let's pump the brakes. Y'all are a couple hours early. <laughs> Give Halloween soon, its due. As soon as midnight hits, feel free. But Halloween season deserves its respect. Come on now. Kids were like in the mall too, in full costumes. Like little kids. I think they do something where they let them trick or treat in the mall, which sounds like the dopest shit to me. That does sound like Like, I would love if each store gave not candy, but one item from the store. (laughs) Of of the child's choosing. (laughs) The child's choosing. (laughs) The crazy thing is, is they would probably just want to keep going back to Annie Ann's like I would. Yeah. Um, but. I, I remember in elementary school, on Halloween, we would trick or treat around the classrooms, and the teachers would give us candy. Oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> that like everything about Halloween, because of the terrors of America, we've had to come up with more interesting and safer ways to do Halloween. And I actually think a lot of them are better. Like they just yeah. sound funner because it's just like, oh, I get to just dress up for a little bit and get free candy, and then go home and chill. Sounds yeah. good to me. That's, yeah, that sounds great. I don't have to walk five miles and probably get a toothbrush. But I saw some politician on Twitter that was giving out pocket-sized constitutions for Halloween. Oh, God. And I, I was so pissed off at him. <laughs> Why the fuck? Like, you're just asking for your house to get fucked up that night. And you deserve it. It's, part of, it's in the Constitution. Yeah. Honestly, you fucking deserve it. <laughs> um, but as I alluded to, the film that I spent my Halloween night watching was Beautiful Boy. And folks, it's officially here. Put your sweaters on. Get your mittens. Y- y'all know. Get your earmuffs. Y'all know what season it is. It's fucking Timmy season. Timmy's back, baby. And this is just a movie about... It's literally just a movie about Timothy Chalamet. Cause it's, it's just <laughs> called Beautiful Boy. And it's... <laughs> It's just a camera that follows him around for a day in his life. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's it showed the title of the movie, and then it sent it like cut to him, and I was like, "Damn, they right, <laughs> they got it right." Ten out of ten. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't have been more astute of a title. A plus cin- uh, What is it called? Cinema score? So they give them, um, like the ones that's like an audience rating. Yeah, the I think that's cinema score. Yeah, this one got a ten because everyone one- knew what they were in for. Yep. Um, but yeah, the, the film's based on a true story, uh, of the chef family, um, following Nick chef and his father as Nick deals with a crystal meth addiction. He, he, it starts off, he's kind of into just drugs tangentially. Um, but it really is about his dad and the rest of his family trying to help him pull away from that struggle and watching Timothy Chalamet deal with that struggle is a large part of why this movie works um i don't think it's quite on that oh shit must see this is that oscar season type type of level but it's extremely well cast like all jokes aside timothy chalamet is the perfect boy to be in this movie just because when he's just there in just pre crystal meth it's like oh this is a very attractive boy who looks like he is groomed for success and like to move on to college and to just get a job like a normal looking dude. And then to watch him kind of break down and have to, to lie and try and twist his family all because of this drug. You see a lot in his, just his facial expressions and in his eyes and in, in young Timmy, he's, he's really great at what he does uh, at such a young age. And I think he does an excellent job of showing that off. Uh, I think Steve Carell overacts just a tad. It, like, ex- 
he he screams a couple times, and it's really hard not to hear, hear Michael Scott when he yells, which kind of breaks apart from what's really going on. It doesn't help that Holly is also cast as Steve Carell's ex-wife. Wait, really? Yeah. They, like, got Holly. from the, Which, when she showed up, I kind of giggled. Just because it's like, I know they planned that. I know somebody was like, this will work better. This will play to the crowd and it'll make it much worse if you think Michael Scott is, like, losing his son. <laughs> oh, oh, wait. If you watch it through that angle, that's fucking crazy. Like, this could, this literally could just be... An epilogue to The Office. An, an epilogue to The Office where Steve Carell's marriage has failed and his son is now addicted to drugs and he has to figure out how to deal with that. <laughs> it's, that's it's the crazy. darkest timeline. I I was gonna say that that it's kind. Of, I wouldn't say it's Steve Carell's fault that the office is just like Michael Scott is just now him basically. Like he's kind of been immortalized through that character. But the fact that they cast Holly in in the movie, they're now they're just kind of asking for yeah, it. Yeah, they're asking for it. Yeah. Um. But yeah, Timmy C's just out here doing his thing, and I like really enjoyed it. When the film wants to make you cry, you'll fucking cry. And if you know anybody or have had any experience with any sort of drug use. It's easy to project that on such a youthful, almost fragile, innocent like face like Timmy. And I think that's really where why the film works so much again. I cried, so seven out of ten. I love that you just call him Timmy. Just like not even a question, like that's just Timmy. The good old Timmy. And nothing sells me on a movie more than you saying, Timmy Timmy C's just out here doing his thing. Seven out of ten. <laughs> he's up though i think next week or two weeks from now the other boy from lady bird is also doing a similar movie yeah i wanted to mention this um i keep confusing this for the lucas hedges gay movie um and i think this is the i i thought i keep thinking this is the timothy chalamet gay boy movie (laughs) um (laughs) but they are doing a lot of similar things now think about it well Lucas Hedges has two movies coming out that are similar to each other, and they're both similar to this. So um, he has a, one is like a boy broken, which is the one about like boy erased. Boy erased is the one about like gay therapy. Like gay yeah, yeah, yeah. He's album. in a J conversion program. Yeah, and then he has another. I think with Jennifer Aniston, maybe uh, or no, Nicole Ju- Kidman, Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts, where he's also a drug addicted boy. Yeah, it's called Ben is back. Ben is back. Yeah. So, like, all three of these movies kind of are the same in my head. Well, and if you also just, bring in Call Me By Your Name, they're all, like, they're just copying yeah. each other. They're going head to head for who's the best young boy. Yeah. And, like, all the posters and the trailers have the exact same tone to them. And, like, so they they literally, like, just all run together in my head. I'm a, I'm a ride or die Timmy fan, so back up, Lucas. Fuck Lucas. Um... That was uh that was I believe that's the only movie you watched this week besides the two that we both watched, right? Yeah. Okay. I did watch some Big Mouth on Netflix. It's a raunchy show. It's a raunchy show. It makes me laugh. Wait, did you watch the new season or the first season? Uh, the new season. Okay, is it good? I haven't watched any of the new. Uh, ones. I've watched it kind of piecemeal because my wife is, <laughs> I I while I was editing something, I said just watch Big Mouth. It's good. Watch the first season because I'd already seen it. She ch- churns through it, and then while I'm doing other things, she just starts watching the second season too. And so like I've missed about three to four episodes, but each time I've sat down and watched it with her, it's still good. The my only problem with it is that the coach character they lean into him even more, and it's becomes very apparent that it's like a mental handicap thing. And so like some of the laughs don't sit right with me as Hmm. much, but all the other stuff, like the puberty stuff is still on point. I fucking love it. Like it's, it's very smart and very good. I love how ugly the characters are. They're all hideous. They are all hideous. (laughs) They're they're all (laughs) frightening looking. Um, so this week, of course, I watched too much shit again because I have too much time on my hands. In my in my defense, my car has been out of commission until today when I got it fixed, so I haven't I haven't been able to go to work. Oh damn! Um, yeah, I haven't been able to deliver the Zod to the nice people of this town, so I've just been sitting at home watching movies and playing Red Dead Two. How's Red um, Dead? So I have some I have some thoughts about Red Dead Two actually. It's very good, and 
I almost waited for it. I have a tendency for when games to come out because I don't like to buy them because they're expensive. So I like to go to Redbox and rent them for the three day period and then just play them through all in like three days. You can't do that with this game. <laughs> it's literally too goddamn big and it's intentionally slow. I've and heard that. Yeah, it's very, very slow. Like it, the main character, Arthur, when you like his regular walking speed, he, he just moseys through wherever he is. And then like the running speed is really not that much faster. And you can only run for a certain period of time anyway, because of the stamina bar. So it's, it's built so that you get immersed into it and you really kind of got to commit to it being kind of an old West simulator more than anything. N- Cause I haven't played the first red dead, but I've seen clips of it and stuff. And it kind of seems just like GTA in the wild West. Mm hmm. Which I've kind of heard is what it is. Yeah. This is completely different. It's, it's so much slower. You like, you really just got to realize you can, you can't rush through any of it. And I'm totally prepared to just be playing this for the next few months because the amount of free time I actually have to play the game and the amount of time that the game forces you to commit to it is too much to actually just like play through it in a week or anything. There's just too much going on in it, but it's very good. This is my question with it and my hesitation towards it. I will definitely play it and get it at some point. Um, but I'm scared it's going to fall into the way Zelda did for me, where like I play it and then I I feel so- somewhat directionless and it's too big and I'm just... I don't know what to do. And so I don't commit to it. So it's... I, I, I can definitely see that being an issue. Um, the thing is, though, is like... I don't. It's been a while since I played Breath of the Wild, and but from what I remember, that that game really lets you run loose and just kind of has you do whatever the fuck you want to do. And there's no real like mission markers or anything. You kind of just gotta find shit as you go, if I remember right. Mm-hmm. Red Dead Two at least has stuff for you to do everywhere. You just gotta look for it. There's main mission markers constantly on the map all the time. Like there's yellow blips on the map where you can go to anytime you want. And do main missions, which is basically what I do. But along the way, you just run into sh- so much shit to do while trying to go to these main missions that you get sidetracked so easily. Like, there are just characters that you'll run into on the side of the road that you can help out. Or, or people are going to try to rob you. Um, bounty hunters come after you. There are trains to rob. If you're just running by a train, it'll, like, prompt you. They could tell you to rob it. Oh, dang. They're, like, yeah, you'll, like, be visiting some random town and, like, someone will tell you about a side operation going on in one of the, one of the buildings and you can go rob the side operation. It's just, you find out so much info just by going to the main, to the main story locations that you get overloaded with stuff to do. So it, honestly, having stuff to do isn't a problem in the game. Because the game is constantly throwing new shit for you to do all the time. And it's a, a very, very big game. Well, um, dang. It might be a problem if you have a tendency and a need to like complete everything. Because there's so much to do at once. You never know what to do first. Um, but it's it's a lot of fun. It's um, I like it a lot. Damn. Well, I wonder when I'll play it. Because Smash Bros. comes out next month. And then Kingdom Hearts is the month after that, and those are the only two games I need in my life. There are too many guys. Go- I'm I'm not usually a big gaming person, but there's a lot of fucking games coming there's out. There's a lot of that good have- stuff. Yeah, I want to play the I want to play the new Tomb Raider, and whenever The Last of Us Two comes out, I want to play that too. Um, and I've been on that Spider Man DLC. Hop back into Spider Man for the DLC, and it's good. God, I want to play that game. Yeah. Um. So too much shit. Not enough time to do everything. But uh, to the movies I watched this week. Uh, first thing I watched was called The Witch in the Window, um, which is like just some little Shutter exclusive that um, me and uh, Annie decided to watch because we were looking for something spooky to watch. And it's basically just about this dad and his kid who his their dad buys a house um, like in like the rural countryside. And he's trying to fix it up so they can flip it. But they find out that it's like haunted by some old woman or whatever that sits in the window. Um <laughs> that's that's really the extent of it and um i mean it's it's just a it's just a decent little spooker honestly it's just a nice little creepy old time that you can just pop on it's like 90 minutes oh, um you said the yeah. magic words yeah um 90, 90 minutes is always the way to go or less um but um i mean yeah it's fine uh there's some cool scares in it um the the dad and the kids performances get weirdly grating they seem like they're trying 
too hard to act natural about their lines um and it gets it gets really obvious um what what they're doing with the material as as the movie goes on um but the story was surprisingly kind of heartwarming towards the end and weirdly kind of sad and um touching so the, it has that going for it um there's not much else to say about it really just a decent little decent little scary time that you can uh, stream for five dollars a month on shutter.com good good website yeah <laughs> Great website. We're really looking for that sponsorship, Shudder, whenever you want. I saw a headline yesterday that said Shudder is going down under, and I read it as Shudder is going under. And with Filmstruck just getting oh, axed yeah. this week also, I was like, oh, no. But you, it, meant, it meant that they're going to Australia or something. <laughs> sidebar again, but do you think that could happen to Shudder? I think if all the of all the niches, Shudder is the one that would last. That and like anime the thing about it is that i don't i i can't imagine shutter makes that much money because it's five bucks a month and it is like a niche streaming service i imagine filmstruck probably made a lot more money than shutter makes but i don't know who owns shutter well think but, about the what the like distribution or not the the acquisition costs it pro- some of these movies probably don't cost that much that's true some of them are probably cheap as fuck because there's a lot of just like low rent like kind of sleazy b movies all over shutter which is kind of the appeal of the service like that's what you're paying for really uh whereas filmstruck yes has a lot of these like classic films that probably have really high costs to get onto the platform that being said i mean filmstruck was it was owned by warner brothers um i believe um when they made it they had to know that it was like a niche service that was never going to get too much mainstream appeal I like I don't I don't see how they could ever think it was gonna get very very high numbers and I don't think they gave it enough time to really like grow into what it could potentially be. It was only a thing for two years. Well, my thing I think what I've heard is so during that Warner AT and T merger or I think AT and T bought out Warner. Um, so I think what they plan to do, or someone bought Warner, what they plan to do is do a giant service. That will also like have HBO as its own thing too, um, so I don't know what's going to happen, but I think that's part of their their roadmap. I'm not sure Filmstruck ne- Filmstruck is dead as we know sh- Filmstruck, but that library might just be used to kind of up the numbers on whatever's coming from from the big company. Now everyone's doing their own thing, and eventually, yeah. it, at some point, I bet there's only going to be like four big large pillars, and you kind of got to choose your content. Yeah, um, which, you know, um, that's kind of inevitable with the way, like, just the streaming structure, the, the, the way of streaming and how everything's structured now. Yeah. Um, but, but I think out of all of them, sh- I love, I love that Shutter's very specific and it's, it's such a, you know what, why you're going there for a mood, <clears throat> a good mood. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I love Shutter. It's my, it's probably my favorite streaming service. I use it a bunch. Um, it's it really is like it focuses in on exactly what you like exactly what a certain crowd knows what they want and it's very cheap. Yeah. I I feel like they got to raise their prices at some point, but I don't know. Um I also watched this week uh continuing on my Die Hard quest to watch all of these movies. <laughs> Your quest. Yeah. Uh, I watched Live Free or Die Hard, the I think it's 2007 um Die Hard movie that um kind of the belated sequel to the 80s trilogy where i guess die hard 3 came in in the 90s but the older three um starring bruce willis again and then justin long and mary elizabeth winstead and some other people and this is a fine this is a fine action movie um really where it suffers is the dialogue and the character work and a lot of just the camera work during dialogue sequences it's very indicative of like the mid 2000s even like somewhat the early 2000s kind of era of action movies um mid 2000s mostly just because it ha- it really goes for this gritty feel there's a lot of handheld camera work the color palette is a lot of like dingy oranges and browns it takes itself very seriously mostly but it kind of contradicts itself in a lot of the dialogue and by having justin long in the movie who does not belong in this movie at all he's comp- he's totally out of place i don't know why he was cast for the role or why his character is written the way it is. But a lot of the dialogue between him and Bruce Willis is pretty embarrassing. Honestly, like it's pretty cringeworthy. Um, 
it tries so hard to be funny and like relatable stuff. And there's a lot of like, you're just an old man, Bruce Willis. I'm the young computer tech whiz. And it's, it's, it's a lot of that kind of stuff. To be fair, uh, when the movie came out in 2007, so I was like 14, 15 years old. That played to me, man. Yeah, I that's it was what pretty this, good. I think it probably played up to a lot of people better at the time than it does now. Um, if you watching it now, it, it feels surprisingly dated for only coming out about 10 years ago. Well, it's a pre, is it a pre iPhone movie? Correct. There's no iPhones th- in the. No, there's no iPhones in the movie. In fact, Bruce Willis steals a cell phone from what, someone um, at one point in the movie, and it's just like an old. It's like I'm, it might be a flip phone, but it's like just a small little like black brick. Um, so yeah, this this came out the year the iPhone came out. Yeah, right? my favorite yeah. thing about this movie, and I still remember it. Two things actually: when Kevin Smith pops up and he has this cool man cave. I at least I thought it was cool at the time, with like Gears of War up in the corner, and then there's a separate moment where Justin Long has a. F- flexible fold up roll up keyboard i thought that was the coolest hacker shit the the keyboard is actually pretty cool i was going to mention kevin smith and how the movie completely sidetracks for about 10 minutes to go into this kevin smith shit and isn't and is like just for no reason really like there's no reason for his character to be in the movie except that we get to see kevin smith for 10 minutes hang out in his as you said cool man cave (laughs) which like the movie could have easily been like an hour 45 if it had cut that because it's about a, uh, an even two hours as is. Um, I, yeah, I was going to say Kevin Smith was another one of my problems with the movie, but I did want to mention that the movie gets it right really where it counts. The action is actually surprisingly good. Um, it's all filmed very well. There's not a lot of like cuts to cover up any of the action or anything. It's filmed with a surprising amount of tact. Um, there's one scene in particular where uh, Bruce Willis is driving like a big semi truck, and I think it's a helicopter that like shoots it to sh- shoots it to pieces, and like you just get to see this semi truck just get blown to bits by the by a gun, like and just get destroyed in very few cuts. You get to see it very clearly. Um, but yeah, um, so like the action is good. So I mean, I have to commend it for that. It's a pretty enjoyable movie. Um, I wrote on here that I could definitely see like my dad watching this like on TNT on a Sunday afternoon while waiting for the game to come on or something. There's movies Um, for that. I love movies that know their role or that like have a specific role like that. Yeah. It's, it definitely plays to that crowd. So that's, that's, that's the best way I could describe this movie as being on TNT in the middle of a Sunday afternoon. (laughs) Um, other than that, um, I'm going to do, we'll talk about this movie first. We'll talk about hell house LLC real quick. Um, Watched this last night on Halloween just because we were looking for something spooky to watch. And this did the trick, honestly. It's about, um, just real quick, it's about um, a haunted house attraction that um, had 15 deaths the night of it, its opening night and no one knows what happens. And so it's a, um, an investigative journalist goes looking for answers um, and they find one of the original owners of the haunted house and she has a collection of videotapes that show what led up to opening night and everything that went on um, in the haunted house while they were constructing it and everything. Cause they're doing it in like an old abandoned hotel. And so I don't think a history to it, I guess. And so it's basically a found footage um, haunted hotel movie while building a haunted house movie. <laughs> um, I uh, enjoyed this a surprising amount. Actually the, the found footage angle actually really works for this. There's a lot of cool scares in the first half. Um, um, most notably involving, a mannequin with a clown mask on and like dressed up as a clown that like moves around the the house there's one shot in particular where someone has a camera in it that's looking at the clown and it's like looking down the stairs to the basement and then the camera turns to the basement and turns back to the clown and it's looking at the camera and it's just like like kind of like little subtler scares like that that um actually really make the first half of this work the second half gets a little overblown. It it gets really more into the supernatural stuff. Um, I do appreciate that it doesn't like explain away everything that's happening with the house. You actually really don't find out what's haunting the house or anything or what actually killed everything. But you see just kind of a lot of creepy glimpses of what it might be. And so I appreciate it for that. And I got, I got a good spook on Halloween out of this. So it's a fake movie, right? It's not like a dot. <laughs> No, it's not. It's not a real doc. Okay, when you started off, I was like, "What? Fifteen people died?" No, yeah, it's it actually like 
um, when I was reading the description, I thought it might be like an actual like documentary into what happened here, but no, it's it's a fake movie. It's a it's a like a found footage horror movie. Oh, fake movie for entertainment. Got it. Yeah. Yes. For the for it's um it's made up, make believe. Great. Good. Yeah. Playing pretend. Um, but more um haunted shit that I watched. Um, I watched that has a very similar name, kind of the haunting of Hill House instead of Hell House. Um, which is the new Mike Flanagan joint. Uh, I say joint as if it's just a movie, but it's actually a, a, a series. It's 10 episodes long. Um, and it's um, about a family who are estranged from each other and who all grew up in this haunted house and that they have a lot of history with the house and each other and a lot of trauma. And all of it kind of colliding together in this series of 10 episodes. Um, that's basically all you need to know about it. And... This is really, really good, actually. I, I really enjoyed this. I've been watching it over the past two weeks and just kind of, um, really, we've been kind of, me and my girlfriend kind of been taking our time watching it and getting through it. And it's a really satisfying show. Um, I really like Mike Flanagan as a director. I, I loved Oculus. I loved, um, um, what else did that man do? Is he the Hold Hush on. Man? He, yeah, Hush. That was it. I, I liked Hush a lot. Um, he also did, he did a movie. That came out on Netflix earlier this year as well that I did not care for. It was called Before I Wake. It was like filmed two years ago and it kept getting pushed back by the studio. It was supposed to come out theatrically, but it never did. And it ended up getting dumped on Netflix. And you can kind of see why watching it. It's not very good. Um, but other than that, he's been, he's, he has a really good track record, record. Hush, Gerald's Game, which was also a Netflix joint. Like I said, Oculus, the Ouija sequel, which was surprisingly good. Um, the, the man just knows what he's doing in regards to horror and this, um, uh, there's no exception this is a very good show awesome scares um this is a couple of these episodes are like some of the best horror stuff that i've seen definitely this year maybe the past couple years um, but what i love most about it really is the structure in which it's told um it reminds me mostly of arrested development season four except they were forced to film Arrested Development season four like that because they couldn't get everyone together. This was a cho like a distinct choice in the way they told this story in which the first half of the show is basically dedicated to each one of the five children and like kind of going through the timeline of events and they all kind of run parallel to each other. And then the second half is everyone kind of coming together and then dealing with what they need to deal with basically. Um, but what's so cool about it is that the reveals that you get throughout the show are so unexpected because you don't know that the show is setting you up for stuff, it, uh, but it is. So like stuff will happen in the early episodes and then it'll repeat in later episodes. And you didn't like, it's just stuff you didn't realize that the show is setting up for you, but it's so satisfying when you realize, Oh, that's what that was about. Cause there's stuff that doesn't make sense in the beginning. And you kind of wonder if it's going to get explained and you see like the entire lead up to what was happening. And, um, it's just the way it's structured combined with these like really like surprisingly nuanced character work and these really well written characters with the way the structure and the scares and the character work all come together to make something that's completely satisfying and something that's so surprisingly calculated for all 10 episodes and the fact that it all fits so well together is like such an accomplishment. It seems like to me, um, because there's a lot of time jumping in this. The, the story basically takes place between the past when they, the kids, when they were like children in the house with their parents and the future when they're adults and they're kind of dealing with everything from the past, catching up to them. And so there's the, there's that time jump and that disconnect, but then there's also time jumps within the two timelines to where, like you're seeing stuff from the past and the future of them as children and them as adults. And like, it sounds like it could get so confusing and so fucked up, but it's just handled with such care and like with such grace, honestly, like the way these episodes are cut together to be able to tell a cohesive story with all these jumps and with all these, like all the setups and all the reveals is it, it's incredible. Honestly, like the way this is structured, is just, I, it, it blew my mind, honestly. Um, but, and then it has, really awesome scares. Some of the scariest stuff I've seen this year. The, my main problem is that some of the dialogue between the characters and a lot of the episode is kind of weird. Doesn't exactly sound like stuff actual humans would be saying to each other, but that's made up for with the fact that the actors are so good 
and these characters are so interesting and they're they're so detailed and their past and their relationships with one another are so just nuanced and believable and emotional actually and so it's just a really well thought out show with a lot of emotion a lot of heart and a lot of really good scary shit in it and th- it's it's like the perfect show to come out in October are these like R rated scares mm, it's an R rated show okay but yeah but the scares aren't really graphic like what do you mean R rated i just like, meant like does it is it allowed to do what it whatever it wants to do or is it hindered in any way in okay yeah creative no, yeah, no. It's it's it does whatever it wants. Um, it's it's definitely like, uh, it, yeah, an R-rated show or TVMA according to Netflix. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, are they thirty minute or hour long episodes? Hour long, and then there's two of them that are over over an hour. Um, the final episode, and then episode five, which episode five I think is un- universally agreed by everyone that's watched it as being the best one. Um, just because, like, again, there's this, there's this ghost that is set up throughout the entire first half of the episode and then you find out about something about that ghost in episode five and it's like it hits you like a brick like oh this wait this makes so much fucking sense ah, and just like dang. you just you just don't even realize that it's like setting you up for that it does it so subtly and carefully and it's just kind of like i i don't know it's it's really good does it work over that two week period so you kind of took your time with this does it does it work taking your time like that or do you recommend like that would it matter Uh, if i took it a month to watch this thing it might mostly because my other problem was that i don't think the ending is all that satisfying totally i think the last episode kind of has a few missteps in the way um it wraps up the story um it's it's not a bad ending the it, it makes sense and it's inoffensive with the rest of the show but just like the episode as a whole wasn't exactly it didn't give me all the closure i wanted i guess from it and it had it it has the worst dialogue of the entire season of the entire show in the final episode it gets weirdly like flowery and prosy and it 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 sounds like people are reading a novel or something and it's just it's yeah it's um not the the 10th episode is definitely not as great as the rest of it which is not to deter you from watching it because now it just that makes it sound like it it leads up to nothing, which it doesn't. Like the, um, the, I don't think that sub- takes away all, all of the great character work that was that's set up through the entirety of the show. Um, but I think it would still work if you watched it over a longer period of time, and it, I think it would work just as well if you binged it as well. Binging it's probably cool just because of, um, you're able to keep track of everything a little bit more just because you all have it fresh in your brain. But yeah, um, I definitely recommend this. Mike Flanagan is just on a hot streak with what he's doing. He's he's really like besides like James Wan, probably like my favorite current horror director. Well, hot um, dang. Yeah. He's he's doing the damn thing. Well, hopefully I get to it before Christmas. <laughs> before Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so that's that. And then the other thing that I saw that me and you. Uh, that was just me and not you was mid nineties, which is the new Jonah Hill joint um, out in theaters now. And it's just about um, a 13 year old kids. Yep. Thir- skateboarding kids. Um, just about 13 year old Stevie who has it um, kind of a hard home life and he doesn't feel like he really belongs anywhere. And so he kind of um, ends up finding um solace in this group of skateboarders in los angeles who hang out at this skate shop and just go skating in places where they're not supposed to and he just starts hanging out with them and they form a bond and i mean that's that's the movie basically um this is um just a nice sweet little hangout movie really um there's not much to it um people people's main complaint with this so far i've seen is that it doesn't really lead to anything. There's not a lot of consequence to it, which I, I think the only reason that's a problem, I do see it as a problem. I, I think the only reason it is a problem though, is because the movie feels, it seems like it feels obligated to throw in some semblance of a plot towards the back half and tries to like force in all of this character drama and, um, like, 
try to actually build to a climax and it doesn't need to do that i don't think with how short the movie is it's not even 90 minutes it's like an hour 24 um this the entirety of the movie should have just been like the aimless kind of wandering just hanging out sort of style of the first half instead of feeling obligated to like fall victim to plot um so it makes the ending feel kind of abrupt and the, and it makes it kind of makes you want more closure than you end up getting just because it ends in the style of what the first half is instead of really following through on all on like the character drama and plot that's set up in the second half but um the kids are great it's very funny i laughed a lot i enjoyed i i i enjoyed watching stevie um that kid that kid's a really good actor um, I think it's Sonny Soljik, Sonny Soljik. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but it feels, and I like that it feels very authentic. Um, it's set in the nineties, obviously. So it could have easily been like kind of winky and naughty about it, you know, uh, or I guess more in your face about it. Mm-hmm. It's not really like, obviously it's a big plot point and, and that's kind of the aesthetic of the movie that it's, that it's supposed to be indicative of the entire of um the entirety of the 90s culture which it I, I think it does do a good job of kind of being showing that like time period of american culture but it's it's not like jokey about it really or if that makes sense like it's it's just it just is the 90s it's not trying to be advantageous with its setting it's just kind of like this is the setting yeah the, like it, the movie just exists in this time period which um, I respected about it. So are the trailers misleading? I don't know if you've seen a trailer, but it does kind of sell the like brother relationship. It tries to at least. Is that not really what the movie's about? Is no, it like not a big at all. music video because that's what it's looked like sometimes. Um, I wouldn't say it's like a music video really. And I saw Taylor described it on his letterbox as being more of a montage. I wouldn't really say that either. There's definitely stuff happening all the time. And the kids, the conversation between the kids and their interactions with each other are um, investing enough to where it feels like there's something always happening. Mm -hmm. Um, But you mentioned the brother. Lucas Hedges is not a big part of this movie at all. In fact, his character seems like he could have not been in the movie at all. And the movie really wouldn't have been that much different. Like, there's a lot of strain between him and his brother. But it doesn't lead to anything. Like, that's that's not what the movie ends up focusing on in the end that's what it's that's what the trailer makes it seem like like that's a central yeah that's no that's completely misleading it's Dang. it's not really about that at all um lucas hedges character really is kind of an afterthought of the movie um i mean which is fine i don't i don't mind it like i said if if this movie had been just kind of as wandering and aimless through the entirety i think this would have worked as a whole a lot better but as is it's very entertaining um it's very genuine um and i think it's it, it's so short that you can't really be mad at it like it goes it goes by like that um so i i, I think it's a good watch sweet i'm probably gonna see it this weekend 80 minutes yeah. that's nice yeah the, it's nice going into a movie and be like man i'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna be out of here before midnight <laughs> so i believe that's it for me but now me and you both watched a movie Near and dearer to both of our hearts, you being a pizza delivery boy and me like a like rat. A chance the rapper. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we uh we both watched uh Slice starring Mr. Chancellor Bennett and what is her name? Something Beats? Um Z- Zazi? Zazi Z- Beats. I don't remember. Um Domino in Deadpool Two. Uh yeah. Dominoes. Dom Ooh. <laughs> Uh, the, the film is about a town that is filled with ghosts and witches and werewolves and, and the like um, being over being plagued with a murderer who has started to just kill pizza delivery people. And I don't even remember if there's other ty- he he just someone is it's hard to explain what's really like the plot of it. Now that I'm thinking about it. like it, it starts with murders and then it transitions to. Oh, there's a hell portal beneath this pizza shop or something. Well, Jay, I can tell you why it's hard to talk about the plot, and it's because the movie's very bad at handling its plot. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't really tell you exactly what this movie is about either, totally. 
like it's about yeah it's about ghosts and werewolves and stuff and a murderer is killing pizza people and maybe other people um but i mean that that's as much as i got from it honestly i kept zoning in and out of this movie a lot yeah i had to watch it twice like i watched it once with my wife and then i nodded off after the first 30 and so i had to rewatch the last hour yeah it's um the ideas are here the 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 ideas um are good and the the movie it's it's set up it sets itself up for success the beginning is cool especially the very opening scene into the opening credits with that ghost man whose eyeballs pop out of his his head yeah (laughs) and then the the animated opening credits and everything it's very cool the animated opening credits is awesome yeah it feels very much like a music video and that's because the director austin vesley or vesley he's a music video director like doing a couple things for chance the rapper and like that's when he seems to shine is in that opening credit scene yeah yeah um and like the tone of the movie is cool too um it definitely feels like it's on a budget yeah there's there's times where this doesn't feel like a real town at all and uh like it doesn't it just doesn't feel very lived in i guess um, mm-hmm. or as lived in as it should, but kind of the moody, um, or not even the moody, but like the eighties thing has been doing a lot recently, has been done a lot recently. Like we're having a lot of eighties nostalgia right now. I think it works for this movie and I like the vision of this town as kind of this eighties horror town. Um, it even has the fucking stranger kids, uh, the, the stranger Steve. things. Yeah. It has fucking Steve from stranger things in it to even add to that. Um, so it's definitely, it's got that going for it. I wouldn't say that's a bad thing about it, even though I'm getting kind kind of tired of all the eighties nostalgia that's happening recently. Um, and it, I like that it feels like a full length goosebumps episode in some respects. Mm -hmm. Um, just kind of the weirdness of it and kind of the imagination is there, but it doesn't do anything with it really. Yeah. I, I said in my various writings is that like this does just enough to be a watchable movie. Yeah. I agree with it it kind of has Halloween Town goosebumps vibes going on, but it's missing I think some of the child like goofiness that makes those work. And so there's kind of a clash between tones in that sense. Um but I also agree that it presents a lot of concepts especially in that first like 30 minutes. Um talking about the separation of ghosts and werewolves and humans and which like it's talking about race relations Mm -hmm. but it literally has no idea how to execute and finish off those ideas because it drops them almost it really just it it does pretty much just bring them up and then they're kind of brought up some more throughout the movie but it doesn't end up saying anything about them or being about them at all really um and that's kind of emblematic of how the entire movie is it has all these ideas and all these things it wants to do but it just kind of throws them all to the wayside or at least it just doesn't know how to do them i i don't think it can balance it It, it's it's odd because the first 30 minutes it's doing all this elevation of those plot ideas and also has no chance in it yeah which is weird (laughs) um i wanted to talk about Chance's character. Oh my god. <laughs> um, it seems like he doesn't even belong in the movie. Almost. Yeah, he he's not necessary at all. He's the only werewolf in the entire movie. And I thought about that on my second rewatch. I just thought they keep having all these werewolf assumptions, but we've n- there's been no other werewolves in the movie, so we have no idea what we should be expecting from him. And yeah. also, he seems like his character, not Chance. That he he doesn't want to be a part of this. He just kind of shows up because he, he they don't give they don't give a reason the, actually. He just kind of yeah, shows I, up. That's that's what I mean. I don't know why he's there. I don't know why his I don't know why his character shows up and I he doesn't really do anything either. Like I don't know. He, he seems like he doesn't need to be in the movie. He says his character says I just want to deliver Chinese food, and I thought about it. And based on the plot and what one of the reporters digs up, that Chinese food restaurant that he works for hasn't been around for like 10 years. Where is he delivering Chinese food? And Yeah. I don't get what he's talking about. There's there's just so much of the movie that seems like it wasn't thought out because 
it was so worried with making it cool. <laughs> yeah, like I will say Chance is cool. I think Chance like there's a lot of just shots of him on his motorcycle with his jacket just kind of looking like Chance. I think yeah. that that works. It seems as if almost they had an idea, like the director had an idea and you're like, "Oh, that'd be a fun little kid spook movie." And then the production company A24 was just like, "Hey, you got to get chance in this somehow. That's the only way we're going to sell it. That's the only way we're going to buy it. And so he just gives him a character to show up. And then the second half of the movie is just kind of the chance show. It just tries to find reasons to get him in the movie more. Yeah. Um, he's also not playing a character, really. He's just being chance, it seems he's like. Not, I mean, he's acting, but he's not very good. <laughs> I don't think he's a very good actor. Some of the lines he delivers, it seems like he's just, he's like, he seems like he's doing a table read almost. Like he's, he's just kind of reading the lines. Um, I will say I do like Paul Shear in the movie. I think Paul Shear is funny. I think Paul Shear knows how to play, play things when they're bad. Like I feel yeah. like Paul Shear knows this isn't very good, but he's been in enough shitty things that he knows what to do. <laughs> if that makes sense. But at the same time, I wonder if this was a different movie when they were making it. Because it just, I remember seeing the poster for this movie, or a poster for it, um, in 2016 when I was living with you in our apartment. And, like, Chance tweeted about it and dropped, like, a little teaser trailer. Which was the and, first, like, shot of this movie. Yeah. And so, like, and I've been, I've been kind of looking forward to it ever since then because I was, I was wondering what this could be. And then to see that it got a one night theatrical release in just like mostly like the biggest markets in America. And then it just kind of got dumped onto Amazon Prime. I knew going in that I was probably in for disappointment. Um, or, or at least something that could not live up to two years worth of interest at least. And I mean, yeah, it's just, um, a disappointing movie. Yeah. It's unfortunate, but hey, if you like Chance, he's in it. I I enjoyed him if, saying if you're that one scene from the trailer where Zazie Beetz spooks him had me rolling in the movie, but it also had I, me rolling in the trailer. So I guess mm, just watch the trailer. I'm just gonna be totally honest. I don't even remember what happened. <laughs> I don't remember that. He like he says something like, "Damn!" like in a really weird voice. Oh, I do remember that because I laughed at that too. It's pretty good. Because se- that seemed like just a reaction that Chance the Rapper would have. To That's play. what I mean. Like, it doesn't... <laughs> he's acting, sure, but he's not really playing a character. When, when he has to deliver plot-related lines, that's when it shows through that he's <laughs> he's not he really... Doesn't, he doesn't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the director had him show up and, like, had someone with, like, poster board behind Zazie Beats. And he just had to read the poster board, and he had no idea what the movie was about. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's Slice, folks. Ready, yeah. ready in 30 minutes or less. Put oh, out. I'm going to st- stop the movie in 30 minutes or less. It's, it's almost like it came out of the oven too soon. Oh, it's half-baked. Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as you can probably tell, we're fucking done here. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and go to the second. You know, first off, I just wanted to say I'm proud of us. We did our normal episode length, really, between the two we, of us. Um, we we did actually, which like um, I walked, I I watched an overload of stuff, I guess, and kind of ended up having more to say about all of it than I realized. But I had um, questions. Yeah, you did have questions, you and then like know. we. We had a we had a pretty decent discussion about slice and it, it all went it all went according to plan. Let's hope it doesn't fall off in the second segment when we talk into the wild coming at you. Here we go. <laughs> that's, that's the Joker. <laughs> I want to buy you a new car. Why would I want a new car? That's runs great. I don't want anything. Everything has to be difficult. There are people in this world who go looking for adventure. Christopher McCandless 
was searching for himself. We're here. We are back, folks, for our in-depth discussion of Into the Wild, directed by Sean Penn, starring Emile Hirsch. The film is about Christopher McCandless. It's actually about Alexander Supertramp, who, after graduating from Emory University, he abandons his possessions, gives his entire $24,000 savings account to charity, and hitchhikes to Alaska in order to live in the wilderness. Along the way, Christopher, a.k.a. Alexander, discovers a series of characters that help him shape his life. Uh, we're probably going to dive into spoilers and talk about all that stuff. So if you haven't seen it, uh, check it out. Or at least I say check it out. But before we talk spoilers, just a quick overview of general thoughts. Trace, do you want to go first? Because I just saw your Into the Wild letterbox review. Because you saved it till just now. Because um, you just finished it. <laughs> and uh, it's not positive, your review. Yeah, it's not. But I want you to go first. I want to start on a good note um, about the movie. Yeah, so... I feel like that... Yeah. So, I don't... I didn't think I would like this movie. It doesn't seem like the type of movie I would enjoy just because it's wandering and sort of aimless. And I thought... I guess my idea of the movie was that Christopher left to go into the wild just because he was like graduating college and that's what he wanted to do. You know, we all, when we hit a certain age, we all just kind of shun society and, and want to break off from the norms and really see the world. I thought that's what it was about. I thought it was about him just having an urge and he wanted to go do it. But when I found out it's really kind of this odd character, not not character study per se, but that the reason that he left is much more psychological and scarring. I was just interested to see him find his relief almost. It was a similar feeling to watching First Man for me, of watching one dude struggle with something, but never quite identifying what was bothering him until the very end of the movie. Uh, but overall I found myself enjoying it and actually interested in what was going on. Um, I don't think he ever spends too much time with these series of characters for me to like get bored with them. Cause they're not really that interesting in themselves. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's pretty good. Okay. Um, you mentioned the word boring. <laughs> <laughs> My big problem with this movie is that it is two and a half hours. I would like to state that the book is about 200 something pages. Dang. So <laughs> yeah, I do not think there is enough here to sustain the runtime. And also, even if this was shorter, nothing about this movie interested me. It interested me at all. Like it is, I, I thought this movie was so dull, so boring. And honestly, I hated <laughs> Emil Hirsch's character in this Whoa. movie. I hated him. I thought he was the most stuck-up, pretentious, little, like, white boy thinks he's, um, like, some kind of, like, Jack Kerouac or, like, or not, that's not his name. Was, who's Kerouac? Jack, um, what's Kerouac's name? Who? The author. Um, no, yeah, it's Jack Kerouac. Um... Like the most stuck up, pretentious, privileged, like white kid that just acts like the most ungrateful little piece of shit who thinks he's better than everybody and does not even tell his parents that he's leaving and does the stupidest shit while exploring the wilderness that like, I mean, I hate to harp on the guy who is dead. But ultimately lead to <laughs> leads to his death. I mean, I just could not get past like the faux, sentimental like the the narration with all these just what's the word um, platitude? That's the word I'm thinking. These these faux um, like sentimental like supposed to be meaningful empty platitudes of that just ultimately don't mean anything over these really like all, like all these crossfades and really badly shot scenes of nature and jack uh wait that's not his name uh fucking what, it, what christopher 
Christopher just like doing shit and just moving from place to place. And what I'm describing right now reminds me of another director that I like, Terrence Malick. And this movie seems like Sean Penn saw a Terrence Malick movie and thought, <laughs> I can do that. I can do that. But <laughs> that's easy. But yeah, but um, he lost any sense of like the enigmat- enigmaticness of it or like the mysterious qualities of it. And instead, it's all very on the nose, just very forward and boring and kind of empty. And it's just none of this meant anything to me, especially not when I did not care about this main character as much as I did not care about Emil Hirsch in this movie. I find that interesting. I thought out of the two of us, you might enjoy it the most. I understand your dislike of him. I get it. I He's just so obnoxious. He is obnoxious. And that's what I thought for the first 30 minutes, 45 minutes, that... Oh, this kid, like, it felt like what I was saying, that he hit 22. He was like, oh, no, is this what I want to do with my life? Is this the world? I reject everything it, with these faux platitudes, like you said. But after that, like, after the, after he, I think his sister is the one narrating a lot of the movie. And she reveals some of the parental shortcomings and what probably caused him to get jaded with a capitalistic lifestyle and the idea of money and the idea of items, I started to see, oh, this kid is just like psychologically scarred somehow. That's what's going on. And he's filled his brain with all these other ideas because he has just been scarred from the other things. And so I, that's why I think, yeah, he is kind of talking high and mighty and he is, way up his own ass but that kind of played into it a little bit for me as in he's filled his his brain with these things and kind of falsely felt like overconfident in his gripping of them in an in an effort to escape from the scars of his childhood and that's what was really the driving force for the movie for me and i i i guess not to put you on blast or anything i just felt like Maybe you're younger, and this is when when uh, when I was about your age is when I had this kind of moment too of like, I think I just told my parents a week before I left, but I just like drove to Colorado because I was dealing with my own shit, and I was just like, I need to get away from my normal life, and I need to see some mountains or something, and just leave. And so, like, I I guess since I've been through that idea, I get what can cause something like this. But I do think he went over overboard and he was way up his own ass. And I can see how that is grating. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, I get the sentiment of the movie. I understand. Like, I do. I hate, like, <laughs> I, I detest capitalism and the idea of money and the fact that, like, just traveling the world costs money as much as anyone else. Like, I understand. I get it. It sucks. Um, but, like, this ca- this guy, like you said, he went overboard with it. Like, yeah, he... He abandoned his family and did not tell anyone where he was. And I understand that he had a rough home life, which was kind of alluded to, alluded toward more than anything in the movie, I think. Unless I missed something. Admittedly, I was kind of zoning in and out of it for a lot of it. Um, but that doesn't come across strong enough for me to think what he did was worth it or acceptable in any way. Especially when, like, some of the last scenes of the movie is, like, his dad, like, on the in the middle of the street crying because he doesn't know where his son went because he doesn't, he never told him where he was going. And all of the shit that he says in the movie and the fact that he's, like, such a free spirit and he's free from the constraints of society and that he's better for it and he's better than other people for it. And he's, he chooses to live this way. It's all just so just, he has such an air of privilege about him. Like the, like he is the only type of person that would be able to do this. Just throw all his money away, throw this secure life away to go rough it out in the woods to find himself. Because it seems like, I think 
he knows somewhere in his brain he comes from a well-off family it seems he he had twenty four thousand dollars in the bank, which admittedly he donated to charity, which is you know I guess a, a worthy cause of it, a, a worthy thing to give it to. But like, it just feels like to me like his privilege comes through through this. Like, do, do you know what I mean? You could feel his privilege, and that's what's keeping you from connecting with him in any I can, way. I, yeah, like the privilege with the fact that like he thinks society is such an awful place and that he doesn't want to be any part of it but like he knows he has someone somewhere to fall back on in case anything goes wrong which admittedly never comes up but i feel like is kind of a major point that kind of stuck out in my brain while i was watching it hmm. um do you think that know. any of that He's- is your own projection. Cause I didn't feel that. I didn't feel that he, I felt like, yes, he knew a security blanket was there, but if anything, that seemed to push him further. Like that's why he probably went so overboard to get as far away from the security blanket as he could. I don't know. I mean, it just, it just doesn't come across that way to me. Um, this, a, a lot of this really came across to me as like, upper middle class slash maybe rich white kid (laughs) wants to go find himself and goes on an adventure and because like is basically in poverty for the entire movie and that's his freedom it just i don't know it just something about it seems a little fishy to me we're reading this two different ways (laughs) yeah i i can see why what you're like the way you see it that's extremely frustrating especially in today's times um, in all times, really, like we've always had these, these wage gaps and, and when the rich can just choose to be poor, it's very upsetting. Um, yeah. but I don't ever think it's that. I don't ever think it's, I don't ever think it's like a privilege. Th- it seems like the, the aspect that he comes from money, it just proves a point and how drastic what he's doing is, but mm-hmm. I don't ever think it's a factor in anything. I think. I think it really just, for me, it it continuously just came across, aside from the first 30 minutes when it does come across as a privileged kid, that he's a broken, sad person. And the movie never seems to really be on his side. It's painting everyone that he meets as like people who either have it figured out or not figured out, but who have their own struggles, but seem to understand what is going to help them get through. And he is the only one who's oblivious to it. So the only one that I don't get is the Vince Vaughn thing. And my wife was confused too. The way Vince Vaughn just gets pulled away by the FBI all of a sudden. That was so strange. They don't explain what's going on. He never, it never follows up. He just gets taken away as if to say, we need to move the plot along. That that was very bizarre. His, His kind of his entire character kind of befuddled me a little bit. But with with characters like Catherine Keener and Hal Holbrook, the older man, they're they're having experiences that for Catherine Keener and her husband, that one's a freeing experience, kind of what he's searching for. But at the end of the day, they they at least the man is like, I need to be with her like we need to be together. And that's Mm -hmm. when the movie started to click for me a little bit that, yes, what he's doing is interesting but it's almost fruitless and the point of it is not there and it's never going to be there. And for some reason he doesn't understand that what he wants is not going to be achieved, be achieved by going to Alaska yet. That's all that's on his mind. He's like, I cannot be whole until I get there, but he's missing the point. He's like, has blinders on because he refuses to think that family or love or other people are going to make him complete. Mm hmm. And it, it comes it comes up again in a major way in the in the in the old man stuff where the old man is kind of had a family and lost it and shunned himself away, run away internally as opposed to what Emil Hirsch's character is doing by running away externally. And that at the end, at the end of his life, almost the old man is like, "Hey, I could adopt you. Like, I could have family again. You could have family again. That's what we need." And I get the, the when he does shit like this, like, 
nah, I get it, but no, I got to go to Alaska. <laughs> when he does shit like that, I get very pissed off at him. But at the same time, because I know he doesn't get it, it's almost pity. And so it have a, I have a sense of like, I want him to understand it. And I wish he would. And I grieve for the dude. I, I guess I had a sense of grief for him that he just was missing the fucking point for two and a half hours. <laughs> See, that's that's what got so grating to me was that he didn't realize what he was doing was stupid as shit. And the fact that he's like, to me, he really is comes across as like the hero of the story, which like I, I don't know. I, I guess I just watched it differently, maybe mm-hmm. um, that we, we just both watched it two different you ways. You did watch it in five, it, five sections. I did. Um, but uh, um, to me, it seems like. Everything he does and everything he comes across in the movie and every everything that he sees and everyone that he meets is so heavily romanticized that it really seems like the movie is kind of on his side a little bit, especially with a lot of the themes through the dialogue coming up about, like, I, you read my letterbox review, it's, it comes across as very, we live in a society. Like, <laughs> the the it's very, like, obvious stuff, like, at one point, he says, "I think jobs are a twentieth century invention," and I was like, God, <laughs> "Dude, shut the shut the fuck up! Like, please stop." It's it's just so it, he's so infuriating, but it's like when when so much of it is so much of that stuff, it seems like the I can't help but feel like the movie agrees with him to an extent, and Sean Penn is almost like, "Wouldn't it be nice?" Um, but on that on, on that same tip, though, I feel like. Because the first time he says it is with Vince Vaughn. And Vince Vaughn almost makes fucking fun of him. Like, yeah. starting starting to shout and slam, we live in a society. And then they finish that scene, and Vince Vaughn's like, you're going to go crazy if you keep if you keep thinking like that, man. Like, let's just <laughs> pump the brakes. Let's pump the brakes, kid. That scene did stick out to me because I tweeted, I tweeted earlier that there's a scene in this movie where Vince Vaughn and Emil Hirsch both just start screaming, society society and it's really indicative of the entire movie <laughs> um i mean i do like the way that you're interpreting it better than the way i am obviously like you understand what i mean yeah. like that's a better movie the way that you're watching it it just doesn't come across that way to me and maybe because i am projecting a little bit into it because of how revered this movie is among the tumblr crowd and like oh is it yeah this was i remember this movie being pretty popular among like young teenagers on like tumblr and twitter who thought like this is that this is the life man society society is a a ruse and it sucks and we need we need to um i I need to free myself by going out into the wilderness and this guy's got it figured out and like i might be that might be like tainting my viewing of the movie a little bit yeah, I didn't come into it with that predisposition. I actually wasn't fully aware of what it was. Like I said last week, I thought it was more Garden State, and I know people make fun of Garden State now. People do make fun of Garden State now. So I thought that's what it was, but it's, you know, honestly, what it's reminding me of is the Wolf of Wall Street. Like, there's a section of people who read the framing of the character, and like, yes, he has success. But really think about where he ends up almost and how terrible some of it is. If that's shown in that way, I don't think the director or the story writer, like, I don't think anyone really agrees with this. So, yes, like, I see why some people would read it as, oh, we live in a society. This kid has it right. Let's get away. Let's go live in the woods. There were also people who, like, who thought. That Jordan Peterson, I think, can't remember his name, from The Wolf of Wall Street, had it right. Like, we got to hustle. We got to go get that cash. We got to gotta live free, die hard, you know? Live free or die hard. Live free or die hard. <laughs> um, and so it just feels the point may get cloudy in that. Because at the end of the day, he dies alone. And that last, like, 30 minutes is the saddest shit. Like, the moment, the moment when he's he's, like... He, there's no more game and he's like screaming at God like why bring me an animal why why is there nothing it has to finally succumb to like finding berries and the fact that it comes down to he just wasn't cautious enough he didn't mm-hmm. read the book right he didn't flip the fucking page 
that he was there alone to have n- no with no one to have his back and that's why he died that moment when he realizes mm. i fucked up it, he's just like screw this it's not worth it why'd i do this what's happening and just has to has to fade and deal with it that's why it felt so sad because it took him until the very end when it was too late to realize that he was wrong the entire time i do think the fact that he dies just from like just eating a poisonous berry there is something like kind of like almost poetically tragic about it but by the time the end came around my my girlfriend actually ended up watching like the last hour or so of this with me <laughs> I mean, this is fucked up because it's the real guy that died, but I don't know. We were like, we were both kind of laughing at the movie at this point. Um, it's the, just because of how, and it could be critical of him, but maybe it's because the movie, like earliest, I feel like the movie seems to be pretty on his side for a lot of it. And the movie is so long. So we spend so much time with him and there's so much like pseudo intellectual babble going on throughout the whole movie. It, it gets so tiring by the end of it. But by the, but by the end I was like, well, yeah, you fucking stupid idiot. That's why, that's why you shouldn't have done this shit. Like everyone told you not to, you stupid, dumb motherfucker. And that's, (laughs) and, and that's why you died. But, not only that, the way the end, I thought his death was so annoyingly filmed. It the, was, it was a little high and mighty. The, the cuts between him and then the sky, and then there's like almost strobe effect of him like seeing a vision of him going to hug his parents. And then there, I don't, it's just everything in this movie is, seems so amateurishly filmed. Which is another problem I have with it. I don't think Sean Penn knows how to handle a camera. There's so many weird crossfades and so many ugly digital zooms. There's even one, like, the first shot you see of him dead, there's, like, a small zoom outward. And it, it doesn't feel appropriate at all. And not only do I think the thematics of it are fucked up, I don't think it's a very well-made movie either, honestly. I think this subject matter... It has to have like an expert hand, someone who really understands the camera and understands how to frame a character. And I think I can agree with you on some level that the fact that the movie can be read both ways, because I see how you're reading it. And again, I think it's just a level of preconception as well. Your mm-hmm. experience with the Tumblr crowd and my complete disregard for the movie in the first place and yeah. not really knowing what it was about. I think that causes us to have these opposite reactions but because it's not handled with such a deft swift hand that that the point of the movie can get lost and i think that is a flaw in it there are points in the movie where he is portrayed as a hero the first time he meets katherine keener and the um and her husband he's kind of the reason they get back together Mm -hmm. inadvertently And so that makes it seem like, oh, this kid knows what to do. And the kid does help the old man get out of his funk and get out of his depression. But ultimately, he just seems to have the saddest life to me. He seems... And I don't think it can glorify that. It doesn't feel like the movie can do that even if it wanted to. Because at the end of the day, he is all alone and is sad for the last like three weeks of his life. And it sounds terrible. Whereas every other person, even his family, sounds like they have a much better life. If anything, I feel like it shows his family more because it shows how selfish he was. Yes, his parents wronged him, but he also kind of fucks over his sister, like who was always there for him. And he just left her alone. That was the part that bothered me the most. I get not telling your parents because they are what has caused your emotional trauma. But your sister, the one you have protected when you were little and like your parents were abusing each other. And the one who is stuck by your side through all of this, you just left her and gave her no hints as to where you were going. Mm -hmm. And that's because you were an asshole. Yeah. And you didn't quite understand the important. We live in a society because we are, as humans, are supposed to be together. That is what a society is supposed to be. Yeah. And I mean. It's how you read that line, I guess. Yeah. 
And like this is probably getting into final thoughts because I feel like we're kind of circling around this, yeah. the same like the same thing is that basically we just saw the movie two different ways. But the I just couldn't like you, you mentioned he was an asshole. I just couldn't get past the fact that he was such an asshole and that I like I really just did not feel a lot of sympathy for this character at all. Um I there was just no part of me that could get behind him or really feel like, and like you said, the fact that he abandoned his sister, shit like that. Like I can't, I just can't bring myself to really get behind feeling sorry for him at all. And like, yeah, the real guy, like, okay. Yeah, I know it's fucked up that a guy died. Like I know that, but just viewing this as a movie, I, I just did not feel any emotions toward this character whatsoever the only other real thing i wanted to mention about it was that i wrote down a specific line of dialogue that said he it's it's to Kristen stewart's character a really weird diversion in the movie i might add yeah um and he said if you want something in life reach out and grab it and that shitty <laughs> shitty stupid fucking line was like is the best example of like the movie that I I can give, and that's that's my thoughts on the movie. <laughs> I kind of love what this movie has done. It is such a point of view perspective. I've never really had this experience of having such a diverse opinion on a movie just because the entire time we saw a different movie. That is it interesting. Like. Because what you're saying, I understand how that line annoys you, but when I hear that back, it just reinforces the idea that this kid ultimately was naive and there should be some sort of pity on that and some sort of sadness that he couldn't understand that yes he ultimately reached for what he wanted but he wanted it because of like some emotional deep level scarring that he could never get over and if he could just have forgiven his parents or talked about it with them had any sort of confrontation with them he could have found peace in a different way and it's just kind of upsetting to me i wish that i saw that movie <laughs> <laughs> i wish that was the movie i watched uh, um but yeah that's that's about all we have uh well, for you here this well, week ag again we ran about the normal length for yeah. for our secondary discussion we really don't need taylor i guess not well I'm at your buddy John on, on Twitter and Letterboxd. That's where you should find me for all this film conversation. Um, I'm at Trey Sever on Twitter and, and Letterboxd. And Taylor is not here, and I guess he's not coming back ever. So I, I guess he'll never come back because we fired him. after He did make the last excellent pick of Jackass 2. That's what we're watching next week. And <laughs> that will be his memory. <laughs> Taylor will live on <laughs> in this episode. And all the past ones, because we're not going to talk about them ever again. Yes. See you next week. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> when I walk beside her, I am a better man. When I look to leave her, I always stagger back again. Once I built an ivory tower so I could worship from above. When I climbed down to be set free. She took me in again There's a big A big hot sun Beating on the big people You know, erectile dysfunction It's very It, it affects your vocal cords Little known fact <laughs>